Hello everyone, today we make a provisional, short and absolutely not exhaustive glossary of uh, Norse military terms used in the Viking era and or, or in the immediately following one. Um, we have made to this point an important amount of videos about, um, if anything, Scandinavian warfare more than Viking warfare properly meant, but we made a video about the Leidanger, for example, and uh, so the, the the ship levy fundamentally of the Scandinavian countries uh, in the Viking era and also after that. Uh, we made a video about the Viking military organization and we'll keep talking about them uh, in general. So today I wanted to fill a bit in time given that I made a shorter video than the usual so I thought to make another one. Um, so keep in mind that many of these terms could overlap and or integrate uh, with one another so that mm, as in all pre linear times the case uh, really was uh, as there is not there's nothing scientifically categorical about them in the first place and especially you know in, in times and places like these uh, it's you know it, the, the semantics show you how you know boundless and, and intense these meanings could be per se not to need that that form of categorization however the first one vikinger as a matter of fact best known term uh, so famous that it has arisen almost and impro very improperly actually to the ethnonym of the whole Scandinavian population but uh, in fact in reality Viking er, uh, in Old Norse simply means uh, pirate as far as we understand you know it, it, if you look it up it's a debated uh, etymology but if you really look at it that doesn't seem to be that um, you know it can be again not categorical and this has nothing to do with its accuracy let's say as it comes from probably Vik so Bay and Inger stands for essential for a dweller or somebody who belongs to a certain place or even to a certain group right so um, this would be the, the 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 Bay dwellers in a sense the Bay inhabitants so um, Everybody knew at the time of what that practically meant, right? Because at the time, people living in those places were constantly involved in, in, in piracy. Um, and th there is even a specific term which it was composed of Viking, let's say, that meant literally going to sea for a raid, right? And uh, Viking was therefore um, who joined these expeditions, right? For the time, at least, in which he participated in them in a sense uh, meaning that again that his lifestyle was somewhat connected to, to to that activity in the first place so even not participating to it still you know if, if that's what he made for a living and again you know it could be resumed or not so and the the term spread uh, also as you understand not with great you know mystery around it in the sense that uh, many of these people some people say at least that you know the, the the vikings perhaps because of precaution would say you know we we are we come from the bays right and everybody knew <laughs> who they were what they had what they had come for, what they had come for um but um they mm, you know the idea is that they would be called like this also by anybody who, who knew what they did in the first place without too much time for presentations as it was often the case but not always because of course Viking activities were not just uh, violent, right? You know, they were political in nature. They were, and so, you know, there was also a big deal of cooperation, of integration, and so on. And uh, still, it was the, the whole purpose, independently from which side you were, was, was of course, piracy. And so there was nothing properly uh, of, of, you know, revealing in, in the origin or the lineage by saying that you were a Viking at uh, that time it just would qualify you as the, the the majority of people and especially considering the the lower social certification of Scandinavia at the time that wouldn't you know the the, the genericity of the term was uh, uh, eventually even as a, a synecdoche uh, a you know a a good the describer let's say you know, of the of these individuals and then the Vering, so the man who has sworn, or at least so the uh, he who has uh, properly made uh, an oath 
uh, of, of, of loyalty, of allegiance. Uh, these were mostly warriors, right? Who had sworn loyalty with, with others in war bands or to their lords in any way. Uh, they were the same thing, you know, eventually what the, the Masnata, even, you know, in high medieval times, the Senior and the Vasus, at the end of the day, were just a reflection of the clientarly um, pre feudal systems that had always existed. This was present in every single people in the world. Um, and it, it the, these oaths were sworn, in fact, to to maintain, right, to devote themselves, uh, point properly, literally through 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 some rituals that were magic in nature, so that these people uh, sometimes were literally dying in the process, because it also involved, um, uh, you know, a, a rite of passage with dramatically violent, traumatic, and irreversibly so, uh, psychophysical proofs, tests, uh, and this was the way to have them reborn into literally another identity into the war band. Um, so the the thing, of course, with the, the, the secularization still occurred throughout the Viking era came to to qualify, generally speaking, this clientele that uh, had sworn an oath of allegiance to a common leader for a common enterprise. Right. This was also the thing in Germanic populations that you know they they elected military leaders, uh, in theory, just as far as the you know for 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 a very specific expedition and um, uh, enterprise. Right. And eventually, political power would ensue in ways that could not really be controlled. And especially throughout all the Viking era, you have the, the loss of freedom, as a matter of fact, and the increase of you know oligarchic power and the formation of monarchies and so on. Um, exactly because of the Viking activity, by the way. Um, so this Varing uh, uh, in the East would become Variazzi or Varangoi, so the Varangians fundamentally, and that's the etymology properly of the same. Then Tekken, that would be substantially equivalent to the same old English term of Thane, um, and it supposedly had the meaning uh, of both, let's say, a, a literal one, probably of a servant, an actual, a warrior loyal to a lord. Uh, it comes from Proto-Germanic Tegnats, that means, in fact, retainer, servant, right? It's often compared with the ancient Hellenic Tecnon, that is child. Uh, some have proposed different um, etymologies, such as stressing, especially the one of, you know, requesting properly a support from 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 the master in the process, which existed and was one of the reasons why these people, first of all, became what what they did, um, and probably the Norse Thanes resembled the English ones, right? In even in in in, in the relative autonomy, and we know, in fact, because the, the Thanes, as you know, we have made videos about the Anglo-Saxon army, were these, um, you know, upper middle class, let's say, individuals who had a, you know, some some semi-professional military experience were at the head of the local communities from what the military from command of you know, the local units, the local militia was concerned. So they 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 were some points of reference for, for their lords when they had to master the, the, the armies in, in you know in a larger scale. Um, and some of the most important connections arguably in fact, and we know that the spread of the term in Scandinavia, both for its recurrence in Norse literature and for its presence of many rune stones, was usually read like, um, you know, this guy placed this stone in memory of his father slash brother slash uh, uncle, another guy, who was a brave Tain, right? So there was a, a pride, properly of status, social status, attached to to these uh, individuals, uh, still, as you understand, tied in a privatistic sense to 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 a lord. Given also that there was no public institution for that matter, so these or, were always working for for somebody else uh, in in function. So then the Uskar, men of the house, right, or probably hus husband, stressing in a, in a, in a sense the fact that these men were already accomplished warriors in many ways. It was a, a term born in Scandinavian that was brought, as we know, by Svein and his son Knutr to, to England and would substitute fundamentally the, um, in great part as this semi-professional, if not fully professional element 
of the military, uh, what 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 the Anglo-Saxon system was, you know, producing of somewhat in equivalence. The reason being that the, the Scandinavians at that point were much more militarized in nature, um, and so there was all they were also connected to a broader system at that point where lots of people, even not from Scandinavia, sometimes it could be Slavs or other continentals, or the same British at some at some level, could could join in a mercenary sense. Um, and it probably meant those things who were full time at the Lord's disposal in his house, right? So um the bodyguard in 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 in, in a way like um the same english term house tains right uh whose, whose cars would take over as a matter of fact because in the anglo-saxon system the social certification at the end of the day would would, would increase uh in part even properly through the clash against the vikings and so all the need for hierarchization that, as you know, brought even properly to, to the birth of the Kingdom of England. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, uh, for, because of the methods of Stilis, etc., eventually England as we, would become an Anglo-Danish country, would would see the prevalence of the Oscars, even just properly as a, as a military model. Then, a uh, jester, or a stranger, guest, from which in fact the same etymology comes from, these were uh, foreign mercenaries, in fact, who served uh, the Lord for some time. Um, they were essentially of lesser esteem than a Tain or a Huskarl, because they were, at least initially, at, in, the, in the sense as, as they could, be exactly because they were defined like this, they were at this at at some moment, some aliens that had were just temporarily there for some reason, and of course could become men of trust over time. And as as we were saying before, the terms can overlap uh, eventually with these changes. And it is said that the name derives from the fact that the locals often found themselves having to lodge uh, these mercenaries unwillingly, and they were thus unwelcome guests in other people's homes. Um, um, a play of of on boards that. Is, is perfectly in line with Norse humor for, for that for that matter. Um, and mercenarism would increase uh, uh, to get you know along the the Viking era in the first place. So these were still ever more important and somewhat institutionalized figures to a certain degree. Then the uh, Riddar, which means literally rider. And uh, at this point, there was no association properly with a later on is uh, with a chivalric title uh, formally meant. And so we are a bit uh, mechanistic, form formalistic. We, we tend to think that there was a point at which chivalry was properly born, but it wasn't quite the case, as we will see now, in um, in especially with the last term of Drenker, um, that um, the um, uh, the the um, the the feudal system would, in fact, institutionalize as such later on. But culture, every culture, uh, had a sense of nobility that was connected to horse riding. This is very evident in, in Norse culture. Uh, think about uh, those representations of, you know, uh, horsemen, heroes of the Vandal era. Look at even the important use that uh, the Norse made of cavalry, actually, Sh surely not like as much as in the continent, but especially if you look at Denmark, they also had, you know, good horse breeds, and and the, the numbers of Viking cavalry sometimes is is quite, um, quite interestingly, um, you know, there. As we will see now, there were um, um, the there would be some continental influences also in the vocabulary, as we'll as we will see with the Stalari now. Um, but um, there was still some sort of chivalric uh, ideal connected to the to the horsemen, right? It's just that uh, in Scandinavia the cavalry was not dramatically developed, right? So the term "ridar" is literally "rider," right? Not like there are other Germanic etymologies like "knecht" or something that also do not really stress the uh, mounted combat, but eventually would become the one of knight or at least uh, here sometimes were properly other um, etymologies in order that would describe a horseman. Um, 
So this determined radar was simply linked to the contingency of the horse. So for example, a Tain and the Huskar uh, that became Riddari were so just because they, they were on horseback at some point, right? And they would fight as it was normal at the time in any kind of way possible, imaginable, like basically any fighter is always done. Um, then Sokaman or uh, Stiresman. So that would stand for helmsman, right? Speaking a bit of the maritime uh, lexicon here. Uh, and this guy was, in fact, identified with a man who could command a ship, not, not just the one who would operate uh, the, the helm or, or, or the sails, etc. Uh, and um, therefore, also, the local notable who commanded a ship of his own, uh, or of the Leidang, that even in here, as we'll see now, uh, you know, sometimes doesn't even make sense to distinguish. In fact, the other term, Leidang, that is theoretically the levy of freemen summoned in half for offensive ex expeditions or in full for defensive ones in case of an invasion. Um, Albay, uh, you know, was, was something you know, much more nuanced and, and theoretical than that, right? Uh, the Viking era had, uh, of course, the, in, in the, you know, in the Norse um, communities, uh, the idea of, of freedom was, was there in, in theory, in the sense that every, um, every freeman was endowed with a, send, with, with a by, by that status, with a degree of nobility, right, in universal sense. We were just talking about it yesterday, about Longobard, Society and this was at the base of every juridical system from the Roman to the Celtic to the Germanic one, in fact. But in, in practice, it was always the oligarchy ruling by a certain degree. So the Viking year was triggered in part by, uh, say, uh, greater or lesser individuals who decided to, to, to start these raids. Initially, you know, the Viking year were something bit um, sm small expeditions, something started timidly. The, the Viking era properly didn't even begin in, in the, I think about Lindisfarne or something, that, that had always existed. Like the North Sea, uh, you know, attacks on Gaul, on Bar look, look at what has happened in late antiquity. It already existed, right? It kind of continued even after the Viking year in other directions, or sometimes the same ones. Um, so it, it really depended on the intensity. And so what we look at the full Viking era like is properly this major, you know, involvement, as we were saying before, of of you know politics and society in these expeditions that would mirror in, uh, in practice also the the hierarchization of society as people who came back wealthy home could gather other people who would depend on them and so starting you know centralized in a minimum very unstable situation as we know but um, this would gradually um, bring the uh, freemen under probably a sort of military administration so what was before was uh, you know in full freedom there's not even the need of a levy conceptually this is the idea because the fr the freeman would just do whatever he wanted right so in instead the Leidang was institutionalized in fact we made a video um, that uh, about the Leidang properly actually after the the Viking era we didn't make a video about that phase but in during 11th 13th century Scandinavia where things were quite advanced in terms of you know, of military administration compared to the previous times, and where things were, were of course, similar to basically any form of levy. Here, what is really striking mostly is that the Leidang is, uh, is mostly a novel thing, because in, mo you know, in most Scandinavian, I mean, wealth was concentrated mostly in the coast, that would, the, all the world business was, you know, think about even some countries like, I don't know, Norway, that is literally uh, either the sea or nothing. And, um, and so this would out, uh, automatically take the form of a of a maritime expedition, and that's what the Viking era was about. Um, yeah, and um, and so this would evolve through over time to a rota system with uh, payment, uh, sometimes with just with compensation, some provision of surplus, etc. And it was very rare to have a full levy in the first place because uh, you know just that would kind of also destroy the local community if it had been 
uh, carried out repeatedly and, and also somebody would have to remain in, in the local community had the expedition go terribly wrong and so uh, to, to stay there to even put up a defense of some system but you know it, it's it, it's like for the rest of me medieval recruitment time that the ancien regime like it, it, it's always a part of the country was levied and mean uh, a minor one never the full thing so that on paper everything could sound ah you know how many freemen are there here we can levy but in, in fact and especially in the Scandinavian case with political fragmentation and stability was was endemic the thing would take very very different forms but if it, it is true that that the apex of some you know monarchic power let's call it in this way also during the Viking era some light hunger could be really really imposant in in size then Stallari, the marshal, we could say at least it's a, it's not a transliteration, it's it's, it's something else, um, and it's the commander of the Erder or Lit, that is properly the Lord's personal troop, as such. And it is curious to note that the term does not come from the Germanic language, but directly from the Latin Stabularius. The etymology had it, it would be taken in fact the one of stable also in the English language, etc., having this. Latin origin uh, that has to do with the idea of station, something st in fact stable properly from a physical point of view that speaks of these places where uh, troops and horses could be supplied, hence the, the equestrian connection, uh, which also in language would remain in, in, in Norse. That the Herser, um possibly from the Proto-Germanic Arisiats, that is army's leader, this was a small semi-independent local noble uh, lower than the Jarl, um, and uh, at the beginning, um, the, the say the spirit of the first Viking Viking expeditions, the the Herser were then increasingly integrated into the landed nobility, and the uh, royal uh, chancery, um, so that they would become some kind of local notables that the the administration of the incipient Scandinavian monarchies would, would rely on on a territorial base. Then the Merkis mother, literally noteworthy man, uh, that we could translate as standard bearer. Mm -hmm. um, that is interesting in the etymology because it's not much the any reference to the standard in in in, in the word, but to the to the to the et at least visibility, uh, literally, of the man who was carrying it. Uh, that has a, almost a totemic flavor, even though it's something slightly different. And it, it's important, of course, because the insignia, as it was absolutely normal, not just in the Norse world, were considered magical, right? And belief um, that wouldn't disappear immediately with Christianity at all, because the same Christianity did it, it's just that in, in, in Scandinavia, the pagan symbols on the, on the flags will go on for for a long time in spite of the formal Christianization of the countries. For example, uh, Olaf uh, Tryggvason and Olaf the Saint both s used the snake uh, or the dragon as a symbol. Uh, Knut still used the raven banner, which will also be used by the same Normans at Hastings because of their Scandinavian ancestry and tradition. Um, and it, it's something actually that you find in, in for centuries, even in other times, I can think Otto of Brunswick, that uh, at least according to the the French uh, chronicles, in Battle of Bouvines still bore, a, bore a, a dragon, a snake, because of this northern Saxon hardcore kind of, and th in that moment, excommunicated an anti-papal, um, uh, let's say, uh, side that maybe it's a bit exaggerated for that point, but still these are symbols that would remain for a long time. In, in Germany we know of the Draco standard uh, that was there since the migration era, even earlier, up up to the 13th century, right? So that's uh, how, and Scandinavia actually had a uh, a dramatic step uh, influence in their, in their warfare as well, which is often overlooked for these uh, symbols to, to remain. But the snake, of course, the dragon is somewhat Universal, as you know, in all Indo-European and non-mythologies, as and symbolize this sense of the, you know, 
of the or also the raven it depended they had different meanings and now if I, I i just look at the reptile the reptile was this negative force that was still uh, however controlled by the the light the uranic element that's still shown on say in the indo-european background of the norse but the the, the the germanic peoples had compared to the other indo-europeans a much greater sense of the ketonic forces uh, because um, having invaded having been more scattered right having migrated to the north the, the least um, appealable area let's say had had to to counter a greater local force than say other other peoples that struck they were stronger struck in in the softer south let's say did so paradoxically you know you've seen the norse germanic uh, mythology the figure of the giants are always there right so these are all ketonic symbols the raven is it also both because it it's about still the the the, the celestial connection but also the one with the underground because it's a necrophagous animal and of course it accompanies the, it's the medium of the that brings the soul of the of the dead warriors into into the Valhalla and so on um and even there the, the Vodanic, uh the Odinic symbolism was pretty mixed in any case um speaking of this aspect the drenger as the last term which indicates from proto-germanic drang Giyats, uh staff, stake, man, servant, right? That, however, took over time this this idea of a valiant, gallant, chivalrous man slash lad that is connected properly to to youth, to boyhood, right? And and the concept being uh, properly this nature, say, bold, reckless, even inexperienced nature by a certain degree. This has to do with how it worked in actually in the war band. That is to say, um, as we were saying before, those who had first entered had to prove everything, right? They had to to commit to the most, uh, to the riskiest of actions, without which they would have never been considered uh, men. So the the idea is that the uh, youthful, also kind of speedier, more elastic. Um, individual that had yet everything to prove to collect his loot that was also literally light more likely armored because he had not yet killed anybody to take to take his arms um, was seen as in that youthful almost um, entertaining character think about Tacitus German mobsters who literally spent their lifetime looking at naked uh, the boys running into a you know into a uh, forest of spears, you know, betting on, them, like, you know, who would come of that alive, that was the form of training they did, um, would uh, would be appreciated as such. So the etymology suggests this kind of still retinue character, not the full-grown, grizz grizzled veteran man-husband like a host car would be, but these more youthful, but still kind of ideally braver, like the idea of the the hero is bold and young and dies uh, dies equally young, for that matter, in the tragic destiny uh, of the hero and of the world. And and the Dranger was essentially what every warrior wanted to be, ideally. Because also the, the Greek Zell veteran would like to be younger, and especially with, with the brains that he has matured, even just to, you know, sometimes randomly, but for being still alive in that, you know, mid-grinder that... that uh, Viking warfare really was to say you know yeah I'm more intelligent I wish I was still like when I was 20 right rather than than now it's very relatable by the way and uh, so the Drenger was the brave the valiant the the virile also because of course you're that age you're also at the top of testosterone generous this was another thing like the idea of being a good natured warrior altogether you know that the generosity was important in all these societies because the idea was a, a create of leadership was was one of redistribution in the sense that the surplus was um first of all ridiculous in the first place and if you didn't share the 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 um, the, the loot uh you would essentially deprive your own Band of that strength that and also for the, of that reason to fight and to fight more and to improve better right so uh, that uh, that made the effectiveness of the same band in fact you know military cohesion is mostly connected to that we see even in some tribes and peoples that as you know as 
homogeneous their middle class was in terms also of wealth and usually and the less greedy their elites were you know the more effective they were from a military point of view so the dranger embodied a bit the uh, this this old moral virtue of the good warrior and so about this we see um properly the ideal of the knight of knighthood uh, I made a video that is called From Herder to Chivalry, the History of a Cultural Direction, and explained there a bit how the, the thing happened. And um, and we stress there how, of course, as we were just saying before, how chivalry factually already existed. It was a prehistorical thing all, uh, since pr probably in the European times was there. Also other cultures had it, including the ones that the Vikings were in contact with, the Byzantines, the Muslims, they all they had their own, their own way, because it was largely universal in a sense but naturally declined with some cultural flavor depending on on the context naturally um so this was you know in scandinavia was perhaps more uh say less connected to a formal ar aristocracy right but still it was the aristocracy of the individual and that level of you know still individualism and heroism that uh was present in the lack of you know uh an authority would could confer rather you know uh that uniform collective discipline just by sheer violence and and subjugation um even a woman actually could be uh drang that mattered there's been a lot of talk about uh uh female warriors during the, the viking era they were actually a thing yes but they were still exceptional there was nothing let's say structural about it that some people would like to to believe it existed in many other cultures nothing strange about that um it's just mm, it shouldn't be overly emphasized for that matter and, and also and i will make soon videos about this hopefully mm, we should distinguish some some characters even from a strictly religious point of view from um properly in the mindset of these people what the female warrior embodied like because that was very often kind of the hypothesis of the same male warrior's uh soul it had what connected with afterlife, with these visions, the same Valkyries that brought, um, uh, that appear in combat bring uh, the moment of death are exactly that vision that is supposed to embody the same thing. So there is a lot of, you, you can't rationalize uh, things easily in a context like like that one, literally, culturally, anthropologically speaking, but we will talk about that. In any case, um, uh, there, there was a real moral reference, it's, perhaps an extra term we can act, that is the Drengskap, which can be translated as the way of the man of valor, the way of the warrior in some ways, right? An ideal, right, to which a bit of, uh, like the one of knighthood, of, of chivalry, um, chivalric, uh, you know, morals, that uh, in, theory, ev in theory, every warrior wanted to conform to, and this naturally had a political meaning, because as the sh same chivalry was was just a model reality was ra you know importantly different but they coexisted right they were functional depending on on the situation and naturally in war could be of the most diverse ones and the opposite of drenker was arger that instead was uh, a real and, and the worst insult actually in that you could uh, receive because it meant uh, weak cowardly effeminate right all these other uh, amenities and uh, it, it was exactly instead the model that you didn't have to to embody because that you know being that meant to endanger the literally the the battle line in your weak uh, spot let's say and you know the the collective dimension there in, in spite the would be so is always present in warfare as superior to the individual one in any case and it doesn't matter how Scandinavian armies were still kind of cultivating themselves in that direction um it was extremely clear and even more emphasized exactly because lacking that superstructure could confirm that homogeneous discipline they had to rely on this individualistic uh, but still you know collectively oriented values that would uh, also need to toughen up in, again in, in the most horrifying ways but still effective ones uh, the 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 youthful warrior into what the reality of war actually was um, and and considered that even just what those people were habituated before entering those military brotherhoods was tougher than anything you can imagine to have lived 
today but yourself right then then taking that other step was really a psychiatric trip and more right then and, and many people actually even died during the process um, as they weren't strong enough and also you know that there were other practices cruel as effective since childhood to even take out the weak fundamentally was kind of properly your genetic idea that you know the stronger had the right to rule by itself it was especially in these more primitive populations that uh, the physicality was more important proportionally because um, there was less again collective training and discipline so that that magic that that is the the strength multiplier deriving from that was to be compensated with all they had that very often was their 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 bodies and and in in the far north of course nature had been pretty malevolent and so even it was it had been and the, the reason why generally speaking also in Europe today people are taller in the north is because they derive from that brutal natural selection that wouldn't um, spare the the most delicate uh, organisms um, but the truth being that it was a vicious political and social uh, engineering too right it was properly constructed in this sense for for all the need that it was increasing now to 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 have this military effectiveness to to raid plunder and you know uh, all around uh in that specific context now of course we will talk about uh viking warfare again uh hopefully soon uh it's strange that on over 1200 videos we haven't really attributed we really didn't make too much viking content but you know uh there is not just Viking history in there. In any case, I hope to compensate for that soon. For now, uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.